Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. Reflecting, debriefing, and taking part in operational learning is a vehicle to identify new or emerging risks, monitoring trends, recommending remedial actions, and promoting the best practice, as well as achieving continuous improvement in service delivery and the safety of firefighters and frontline operators worldwide. Just over 30 years ago, a fire occurred in the East End of London that led to seismic changes in the way that the UK Fire and Rescue Service trains, learns and manages its staff. The fire itself, which led to the death of two firefighters brought about by a series of failures in operational procedures, opened a can of worms, which, even today, is having an impact on the service. In today's episode, we're going to be going over the Gillander Street fire that led to the death of two firefighters and a subsequent inquiry that would lead to a massive change for the service itself and the way that it's still being led today. Today's episode was brought to you by our good friends at Williamwood Watches. We put so much thought into the people that we partner with on the podcast and Williamwood Watches has been with us since the beginning. This is a company that's got authenticity baked into every aspect of its fire service traditions. Now they have six different collections now. In October, they brought out their new Fearless collection. Some refer to this as the dark side and it's their first field range watch. Now I've been speaking to some people in the past who have got that Williamwood watch for a specific occasion for something really smart, really classy. But the best thing about the Phyllis collection is that it's built to be worn in active surroundings. It's got that compact, rugged aesthetic on your wrist. One of the biggest things people have commented on if you go over and look at their socials is the firefighter helmet case back. They always do something special with the back of all of these. Now before this, my favorite was the Triumph collection, but if you go over and have a look at this one, they've pressed into the back of each watch, the UK firefighter's helmet. It's got the glass visor where you can glance through and actually see the movement of each watch. Now again, if you're unfamiliar familiar with it, the massive core of all these William Moore watches is the upcycling of firefighter materials. And the Fearless Collection has got a 100-year-old British Brass Firefighter helmet melted down and placed inside the crown of the watch. That's exactly the same as they have with all of their collections. But this one also features repurposed black fire hose, which is a really rare one for these. So go over and check out the brand. I myself went for the Valiant watch. I've had this for a couple of years now. Really nice. I've got it in the red strap, but I'm also giving some serious consideration to the new Fearless Collection. There's a whole range of payment options. Go over and take a look at them. William will watch is Johnny and the team are there to give you that experience. Whether you're thinking of a retirement gift, you've got something special to celebrate, or you have just started your emergency services career, go over and check them out, williamwoodwatches.com. The best way to support the podcast is to support our sponsors, so please take a click in the notes below. Now back to the show. Now the fire itself, as is often the case, was nothing that would normally be deemed an exceptional or unprecedented. The premises was located on the east side of Gillander Street, numbers 24 to 26, Romley by Bo, in the London borough of Tower Hamlets. The building was constructed of brick walls, concrete and steel floors, with a concrete roof covered by asphalt. It was seven floors high and had an area of about 5,000 metres squared in total. The premises had originally been fitted with sprinklers under Section 20 of the London Building Act, but as a result of the introduction of the National Building Act, the sprinklers were removed in 1986 because the requirement was superseded and made redundant. The building was owned by Hayes Business Services Limited and rented by several other companies for storage. The fire was detected by an automatic fire alarm system at around 14.23 on July 10th, 1991, and the alarm monitoring company, ADT, was notified of the actuation at this time. While the ADT operator was in the process of calling the fire brigade, at 14.25, the premises rang ADT and cancelled the original alarm. On their arrival at the compartment, security staff confirmed indicators of the fire were present. They initiated a full evacuation of the premises and made a further call to ADT, confirming that this was a fire and requested the fire service be called. The first call to the fire service was received at 14.30 and mobilised three pumping appliances and a turntable ladder. The first pump from Poplar arrived at 14.36 and the incident commander, who was a sub-officer, located the alarm panel and found that the fire was shown on the second, second floor mezzanine and third floor. Crews started setting into the dry riser main, ready to provide water. Having examined the alarm panel and available plans, the incident commander, now a station officer, decided to investigate the second floor mezzanine area. Firefighters then went with the security guard who suspected the fire was in the electrical equipment. They carried a BCF extinguisher with them. On the second floor mezzanine entry, they found a wispy smoke and the station officer instructed a crew to rig in BA and then set up a BA engine control point on the second floor staircase. The BA team of four made their way into the building, taking with them the BCF extinguisher, water extinguisher and a pair of bolt croppers. They were instructed to investigate and report back. The team located the fire and requested a hose line to be deployed along with a jet. 
They deployed a 45mm hose line consisting of four lengths and terminating in an adapter to which a length of hose rail tubing can be connected to an improvised adapter and terminated in a hose rail jet. The hose now charged and the crews entered the fire compartment, which, by this time, was giving off an intense heat and smoke visibility only being around two metres. The team withdrew because of the heat and stated that the main jet would be required. A relief team replaced the initial team but found the hose rail jet ineffective and they were unable to attack the fire. Crews withdrew from the fire compartment but the fire resisting door were left partially open because of the hose prevented it from closing. Outside the building, a make pump six message was sent at 1509. This was 33 minutes following the first attendance. Among the reinforcing appliances were pumps from Silvertown and Stratford fire stations. Around 1519, a divisional officer took command and instructed a second jet be taken to the mezzanine floor. He sent a make pumps 10 message at 1535. He also instructed another jet to be made ready for an attack from the rear of the building into the second floor mezzanine. A 17mm hose line was taken to the second floor mezzanine and 20m down a corridor when the crew, a team of 4BA, encountered significant heat. They inspected the floor above and below for signs of fire spread, but found none. They returned to the 70mm hose line and made their way into the compartment but found the line too short and withdrew from the building. The 70mm hose line would remain uncharged throughout the incident. Outside, they explained the issue to the newly arrived ACO, who they assumed, in error, was now in charge. He did formally take command at around 1600. At around this time, the incident commander, still a divisional officer, initiated a BA main guideline to take crews quickly to the scene of operations on the second floor mezzanine. A BA team of four, complete with communications, was instructed to lay the guideline. This mixed team, Silvertown 1, consisted of two firefighters from Silvertown, one, David Stocko, with 18 months experience and one, Terry Hunt, with 12 years experience, a station officer and a probationer firefighter with three weeks experience from Stratford. The team leader was connected to the guideline and the others attached by personal line to the person in front. The guideline was laid but was required to be extended with the second guideline to reach the fire compartment. It was subsequently found that the guideline tallies were not properly connected to the line and the method of joining the two guidelines was incorrect. By this stage, Communications were proven to be problematic and the station officer started using his own radio to ensure messages could be transmitted and received. By the time the team had reached the end of the hose line, which was still uncharged, and the hose reel, the conditions were reported to be difficult. Having taken a BA cylinder air check just before withdrawing, the station officer took a probationary firefighter to view for himself the fire conditions that would help him prepare for future incidents. After a few steps into the compartment, they found conditions untenable and withdrew. At about 1600, a branch line was ordered to be laid in the main guideline on a right-hand search to look for fire spread. Having made their way to the second floor mezzanine through what were increasingly difficult conditions, the BA team, Silvertown 2, came to what they believed to be the end of the guideline. The guideline bag was on the floor and the smoke density was heavy and thick. They laid the branch line as instructed to the right to permit the search for fire spread but incorrectly attached it, which may have led to subsequent confusion. Due to the heat and intense smoke, they became disorientated and laid the line back along the same corridor down which they had laid the first portion of the branch line. In effect, creating a condition where the directional tabs on the lines indicated both the way in and way out of the building were only a few centimetres from each other. In other words, the preconditions for confusion were in place. As Silvertown 1 began to withdraw, they came to the point where the initial guideline, A, the guideline extending the initial line and the branch guideline joined together. With air running out, and the heat and smoke increasing, there was understandable chaos, distress, and confusion. The team, believing they were heading out, were confused by the positioning of the tabs indicating they were heading back into the fire compartment. Eventually, a tangle of guidelines was found, and after a disagreement, the station officer, now with his low-pressure warning whistle actuating, and the probationer, followed one line which eventually led to the second-floor mezzanine staircase. By the time they reached the staircase, the station officer's cylinder was nearly empty. In the confusion... This part of the team passed another BA team, Silvertown 2, but were too physiologically exhausted to communicate effectively their distress. As they entered the staircase, the station officer collapsed onto two firefighters, causing a high-pressure hose leak in one BA set with his own cylinder now exhausted. He was carried out by two firefighters and his face mask removed to help his laboured breathing, all with the probationer still attached to his personal line. The part team left the building at around 16.30 and following treatment by ambulance staff, the station officer was taken to the hospital at 17.43. Debriefing of the team was difficult due to the distress and exhaustion suffered, but the probationary firefighter told others that the other two firefighters in the team were going in the wrong direction. At 16.44, a further team of four was committed to the building and made their way along the main guideline to rescue the missing firefighters. 
They silenced the fire alarm bell to listen to what they believed to be an automatic distress signal unit, ADSU, and locating its proximity, made their way through the double doors following the hose. They found both firefighters immediately, semi-reclined, both ADSUs operating. Vital signs were checked, but there was no pulse and their cylinders were empty. The team struggled to get both firefighters to the nearest doorway and were running out of air themselves. They met a team from Leytonstone, who, despite being their third deployment into the building, began the firefighters' evacuation, assisted by firefighting teams from Bethnal Green and Lee Green and Stoke Newington Pumps. The first casualty, Firefighter Hunt, was rescued at around 1725 and after attempts at resuscitation at the incident, was removed to the London Hospital at 1739, but was pronounced deceased on arrival. Firefighter Stocker was rescued at around 1740 and taken to hospital where, once again, death was pronounced at 1802. Seven of the firefighters were injured at the fire, which eventually took 20 pumps to control, and the fire surrounded message being sent at 1951, and the stop message finally at 2045. The incident was closed at 2051, Friday, July 12th, 1991. Next, we're going to cover some areas of the investigation. London Fire Brigade began a detailed internal inquiry immediately, which identified a range of issues, some seemingly straightforward and some less so. Their findings included the delay in calling the fire service caused by the investigation by security staff to ascertain the validity of the alarm, ironically a protocol now positively endorsed by many UK Fire and Rescue Service in order to reduce the incidence of mobilisation to AFAs. Pre-planning, risk awareness and local knowledge were also found to be deficient. Also, practical skills found wanting, particularly with respect to breathing apparatus operations and the application and use of improvised equipment. For example, the hose wheel adapter for the end of the hose was not a piece of service equipment. Operational control and tactics of the incident were criticised, with a slow initial makeup, which was 33 minutes from arrival of the first pump, confusion at time of who was in charge, perceived multiple commands and problems with communications, especially radios, as well as an inappropriately light initial attack and hose ready for use that remain uncharged throughout the entire incident. Breathing apparatus procedures and their application were heavily criticised and found to have significant failings and omissions. Mixed crews were seen as a bad practice, although today, with low levels of crewing in many fire and rescue services, mixed crewing is far more prevalent than 30 years ago. Officers were criticised for using probationary firefighters at the incident with one team of six being led by a probationer. The BA board clocks were not synchronised. The initial BA inch control point was located on the second floor staircase but subsequently relocated as the result of the fire growth and there was no dedicated emergency crew available for much of the incident. Fundamentally, despite uncertainty of the number of missing firefighters, many BA tallies were not collected on withdrawal from the building and perhaps most pertinently at this incident. The correct use of guidelines, branch lines and personal lines was not demonstrated effectively at the incident and remains a critical element in the chain of events. As experienced many times before and since, there was a failure to understand and recognise the impact heat stress can have on BA wearers and the consequences of a distress that can occur. This could have been identified by effective debriefing and welfare assessments of existing BA team members as the conditions occurred in the building at the time. Hey folks, just wanted to jump in with a quick piece around firefighter health and well-being. Now we get a lot of messages and emails into the podcast around firefighter health and fitness, whether you are trying to join the fire service and pass them tricky fitness tests, if you are currently serving or if you are coming up to that next chapter of your life retiring from the emergency services. We get so many different questions around it. So in partnership with Fitness for the Frontline, we have come up with a series of guidance and programs specifically designed to reflect the physical elements of the role of a firefighter. So whether it's carrying an LPP across an overgrown field, lifting a ladder above your head, under running it, or wrestling with cutting gear for 30 plus minutes as some kind of complicated RTC, our bodies are required to lift, push, and carry objects in very specific circumstances. That is effectively what Fitness on the Frontline focuses on, as well as the longer term aspects of overall health and wellness for our firefighters. There are focuses around strength, strength endurance and overall conditioning, all achievable and relevant to our roles. Now we are definitely not about to be smashing out world records or getting that beach body ready in six weeks rubbish. The systems and programs that we put in place are adjusted for people's current fitness levels and they're not a prescriptive weight or a one size fits all BS. We also take into consideration all the fitness testing for initial application and also for current firefighters who want to maintain and progress their fitness levels. It is very likely for myself personally that I'm still going to be a firefighter when I'm 60 plus. So longevity in the role is really important to me and I know it is for so many people out there. The system has a built-in ability to adjust easily depending on the equipment you have available, your fatigue levels, or if you're coming off busy-ass night shifts and you haven't got a lot of time to work out. You can record your results, log your weights, your body measurements. 
We've got all the facilities to do that. The system is yours to use how you want to train. We've taken all the fluff and the gimmicks and the BS away from most of the rubbish that you see out there. It all starts with no obligation, seven days worth of the programming. Absolutely free. So whether you're joining, serving, or looking at the next chapter in your life, have a glance in the link for the podcast. Fitness for the Frontline is designed by firefighters for firefighters. Now back to the show. We're now going to zoom out to some of the wider impacts of this incident. Last year, the Fire Brigade Union General Secretary Matt Rack spoke on the 30th anniversary of this incident, stating that he had personal links to the tragedy, having worked at the Kingsland Fire Station with two of the firefighters who died and having attended the tragedy himself on behalf of the FBU. The FBU drew a clear link between the tragedy and the current attempts to weaken breathing apparatus regulations for today's firefighters, saying that the progress made after this fire and several other tragedies is in danger of being turned back. The leader of the FBU stated this was a tragic loss to the life that has stayed with all that were affected, including the families and workmates. David and Terry did their duty and went into a dangerous warehouse fire but paid with their lives. The UK Fire and Rescue Service remember their bravery today and continue to be missed by family, friends and colleagues. Unsurprisingly, the tragedy sent shockwaves across the service and the health and safety executive became involved in the investigation. Two improvement notices were served on London Fire Brigade concluding the service was not providing adequate training and development for its people. These improvement notices were to cause a sea change across the whole range of aspects across the service, perhaps unfairly on the part of some fire and rescue services. The notices led to two main strands of the change process. The first was an introduction of training where competence was an underpinning principle. The second aspect of the notices were to lead to the introduction of Integrated Personal Development Systems, IPDS. A training strategy group, TSG, developed ideas and concepts that were radical and ultimately led to the abolition of both statutory examinations and a promotion system underpinned by legislation. While many of the ideas and developments had such merit, it appeared that the baby had indeed been thrown out with the bathwater and failed in some of the key aims of IPDS. Differential application of development and promotion processes by 52 or so fire and rescue services helped to create a parochial system in each service and the loss of a standardised approach to management at all levels. Evidence of the IPDS as an entity is almost non-recognisable in services today. The question is, could it have been so different? The Health and Safety Executive Investigation looked at the processes that London Fire Brigade had in place for training and the issues both they and London Fire Brigade had identified. Cultural aspects that underpinned some aspects of the failure were not necessarily investigated, and it is still a common assumption to equate activity levels of a fire station with the level of competence. A station attending 3,000 calls a year can often be assumed by those at the station to have more experience, be more proficient than a station attending 500. As a consequence, the requirement for routine and formal training may be perceived to be less important. But if the 3,000 calls are actually 500 real incidents and 2,500 are AFAs, as is still the case in many urban and city centre stations, is that perception correct? It's been speculated that busy equals competent. But the question is, do we now have better trained, more knowledgeable firefighters and better organisation on the incident ground? Superficially, the answer is yes. But if at the Gill Industry incident, the Silvertown 1 team had stuck together and if the two firefighters had hooked onto each other correctly to the correct guideline and come out safely, would we have known about the range and severity of failings? The odds are we would not. As with other fatal incidents involving firefighters, such as Blainer, Pulse Harewold and Atherston on store, there seems to be a set of underlying and root causes for the tragedy. But it is only fate that allows the holes to line up and end in tragedy. How many fires are being attended in the UK right now, where there are multiple critical failures occurring, but the final fatal link in the chain is missing? It's important we never forget these mistakes. So many of these changes in policies, procedures and operational guidance come at the cost of somebody's life. The purpose of debriefing is to identify good practice and areas for improvement. Debriefing plays a significant role in the encouragement of reflection, accountability and maximising learning for everybody. Debriefs and inquiries are often forgotten and can be carried out half-heartedly after incidents, meaning that the key lessons are not learned. Debriefs are an opportunity for personal and professional growth. These should be encouraged at all levels of organisations to give us a structured learning process designed to continuously evolve the plans that we are executing, how we're doing the job, to ensure we're protecting our operational personnel through the right training and preparedness. It is worth noting that BA guidelines are still a control measure for the deployment of breathing apparatus wearers. The deployment of breathing apparatus guidelines should be based on appropriate risk assessment and in accordance with the incident plan. The incident commander should consider using alternative or simultaneous tactics to assist operations to enhance firefighter safety. These may include adopting tactical ventilation techniques or additional access points. Wherever guidelines are in use, Stage 2 BA engine control procedures should be implemented for the whole incident. 
The use of guidelines should be regularly reviewed and all relevant personnel should be informed that they are in use. Additional BA support teams should be deployed in conjunction with BA guideline laying teams and guidelines should be stored, maintained and tested in accordance with the advice of the manufacturer. If not correctly stored, this could result in guidelines being paid out incorrectly or being in an unsafe condition. Whilst there's an underlying theme that these are extremely unpopular and will perhaps never be used again operationally in many UK fire and rescue services, they're a piece of equipment that still remains on many trucks out there. So don't neglect it, get familiar with it, so that we don't have to learn these lessons again. So I sincerely hope you've taken some learnings away from today's debrief, and we'll see you next time. The Firefighters Podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operators. Through a series of wide-ranging conversations celebrating those within our sector, we seek to encourage and support this incredible group of people. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter, Pete Wakefield, and I speak with individuals from all walks of life who I sincerely believe can add value to or develop those who have chosen this life path. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world, and thank you for listening.